Thank you. All right. Uh, I hope you guys have a great conference. It's been awesome for me so far. I see familiar faces in the audience. I see uh, people from several areas uh, of uh, work. I see we're running a little late. Uh, lock the doors. <laughs> um, let's try it like this. Uh, I'll try to finish my presentation on time. I'll be around for the rest of the day. Please arrest me for questions, and uh, I'll be more than happy to help you. Okay, um, a few things about me. I'm a developer advocate. Um, my slides, including these ones, I, I mean, I always like when people take photos of my slides and post them on social media, but here is my GitHub handle, U1I. You'll, f you'll see projects that I run and slides, including this one, uh, in the repository and you can also follow me on LinkedIn. I post uh, quite frequently and I'm based in Singapore. You see a few steps of my previous career uh, on the right side and yes I work uh, for Axway in a, in a global role um, and um, yeah I travel a lot which is a nice, a nice part of uh, the role as well. right? So, and, and you obviously see I like photography and from the photos, you might see a few things that I actually very much like a lot. So if we talk about social media, this is another platform that I use. And uh, since I'm also a geek, at some point I was curious. Right? We, we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, machine learning. Right? What if, because this is very abstract to me and to many people as well, so I, I was curious, what, what would an AI think if it looked at my, well, thousand plus photos, right? what, well, what would it say about me? And before I show you how I did that, I'll just show you the result. Right? So obviously food is a very big theme in my life. But yeah, if you told me that 20 years ago, so here is a, it's called a word cloud. I'm sure you've seen that many times. So the bigger the word, the more prominent it is, right? If you told me that 20 years ago, I think that, that is science fiction. Because the machine didn't look at any tags or anything or meta information. It was just looking at the photo itself. Right? Um, and I made that in a lunch break. How is that possible, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm a Python person. Uh, and I used an artificial intelligence which is, in this case, from Microsoft. There is many others. This is the one that I was familiar with. This is the one that I used. And I used API. Right? And now that, I, that you know a little bit about me, as a presenter, I'm always curious who is in my audience. So um, let's not talk about roles or what your job title is, but who is working with code or aims to do more on the coding side? Can I just see a few hands? OK, that's a good mix. right? So I've, I've been at the conference yesterday. We've run hands-on labs actually in the, just in the room next door, where I also realized people start their journey on various levels, right? Some of them have questions like, how do I go about starting this API journey? And some people come to me with quantum physics questions, right? So I try to include interesting things for both sides in this talk, right? So the point for me is there was, there was something really complicated, and I was able to build that. So you all guys know when you go to Google and you search for pizza, it gives you 50 million pizza photos. This is the opposite way, right? So I have an image, and I'll use the API to say, here is a photo. What do you see? So all these, the text, the tags, and the confidence level, in this case, it's 92%. It's coming from the machine, right? A cup of coffee, 85% confident. A wooden table next to a window. I think this is in Ho Chi Minh. A sunset over the ocean. I have no idea how the machine does it, but it's pretty awesome. But you see this one? A bunch of bananas? No. But it's only 37% confident. So the only thing that I actually did is tell the machine, if, if you are less than 80% confident, discard it. What do we want to talk about? Right. This is about open banking, some of the roadmaps, the evolution, some of the challenges that we see, and what does it take to build great APIs. 
Um, because I was just showing you this because I think it's a great example. There was something really complicated, something abstract, um, an artificial intelligence, a machine learning. I didn't know how to use it. I wouldn't know how it works, but I know how APIs work in general, and it takes me a lunchtime to understand how to use it and how to build something out of it. And that's, that's why we are talking about APIs, right? If you think about, well, let's say you have large databases, large systems, large departments. How long does it take for someone who joins that department to figure out how to use the system? How long will it take for somebody else from another department to say, you know what, I just quickly, no, no, not possible. How long does it take for you to onboard a business partner, a customer, right? The idea should be you want to run a hackathon at NUS and they're able to build a Hello World program in five minutes, right? And that's, that's, that's why we are talking about this topic, right? Because it's about, who knows this person? I get a t-shirt. Yes, Maurice Moss from the IT crowd, right? Because developers are very special people. So marketing works very different for them. They can instantly verify stuff and they have very special needs, right? So I, there is people who work for banks and say, how can I get developers interested in working for me? What sort of environment do we have to create? What sort of roadblocks, uh, road, I'm sorry, roadblocks do we see? What do we have to eliminate, right? So it's very much about developers. And my point is always, if you're not a developer yourself, I'm not sure you're able to think like a developer. You've got to have a developer friend who helps you, right? So some of these things, and I'm sure when we talk about open banking, there are several people in the room who can tell the story much better than me. But I know people who are getting thrown into an environment like this, and they, they ask me, so what's that open banking stuff about? I hear so much, and it's so prominent, and it's everywhere. How do I start, and what is it, right? So that's where I talk about the two worlds, right? Where we have the, uh, the open banking side, which is initiated by regulators, right? And we have the fintech side, who are, well, offering similar services, but they are, they are having a completely different set of dynamics. And since we're talking about geeks, right, this is something that speaks to them. And, and we don't have to go into details. You've seen the sessions today and tomorrow where, to me, the big bang is PSD2, right? The, the revised payment services directive where, where they said, you know what, we want, we want the consumers to, to, to choose who is running uh, their financials and you are still using the money who is in your safe traditional bank account and we are, well, strongly encouraging the banks to open up the systems, right? So we have innovation, we have transparency, and we have uh, better protection for consumers. And um, that's where uh, some of the great things that came from the UK was one of them where they said, you know what, this is all awesome. Let's, let's look at our nine largest banks and, and have them think about this. And they said, you know, that whole payment stuff is awesome. That's, that's phase number one, right? And what, what does it, I mean, we want to do more, but what does it look like? So it starts with accounts, right? If you want to do payments, you want to know what sort of accounts uh, does a certain consumer or a certain entity have, right? Payment initiation, pretty obvious. But I also need to verify, did the transaction go through? Was there an issue? Did it bounce? So I need the transition, uh, the, tra the transaction history as well. And then, obviously, right? I mean, we are in a in a global economy. There is certain adoptions for it, and uh, um, we, we are we are here in Singapore. At, uh, you've you've seen that uh, the guys in Hong Kong are doing things a little differently, and and the guys in Australia said let's 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 uh, not do this in a regulatory fashion, but but yeah, keep the dialogue open and. This is just one example of how things are looking like in Singapore, right? Back to my point uh, of the perspective of a developer, right? If you are working for a fintech, and, or if you are actually interested in how APIs work, you can go to the DBS uh, developer website, you sign up, you have a sandbox access immediately, so you won't be able to actually do um, transactions on the real systems initially, but you can build an application right away where you consume around 200 APIs, right? And you can also learn how other people 
design and build APIs, right? So that allows you to immediately create offerings and financial services based on uh, uh, the backbone of a bank. Because th that, is, that is the point that I made earlier, right? How do we, we, we are in an in a interconnected world. Everything connects with each other. We have Payla. Um, I'm a Payla user. I'm sure many of you use that as well. Right? It's on your phone and you have QR codes, but ultimately these are transactions that happen, I don't know, maybe on a mainframe. We don't know. And my point is maybe we don't have to know right? because we are looking at things from a developer perspective in order to build all these new services. So it's about how do I quickly get started? How do I have a sandbox? How do I get access? And by, by the way, I'm not a Python guy. I'm a .NET person. Can I have code samples in my, in my flavor, please? Right? So that's um, when you look at things from a, from a fintech perspective. However, I work with a lot of uh, customers who are also looking at the provider perspective, right? How do we, how do we build something like this? What are the roadblocks? What's, what's the evolution, right? And what are the challenges? And I think you can talk about a lot of things. I've picked a few, and I'm also hoping to give you a few suggestions on, on what, can be, what can be done. I've just spoken about the from zero to hello world in five minutes. I'm not very religious about the cloud, right? Should you use the cloud? Should you not use the cloud? But I'll say as a developer, uh, the cloud helps me to uh, think in different time zones, in different time terms, I'll say, right? So I don't want to wait five weeks to get access to a resource. To be honest, I don't need it in five minutes. But five hours would be nice, right? And, I, and I'm sure it works. To give you an example, I was running a hands-on lab yesterday, and it was one with the large cloud providers. And uh, on, on fr end, of, end of last week, I realized, oh, yeah, I probably need to tell them that I'm going to spin up 80, 80, 80 virtual machines. Got to tell them. I opened a ticket. I got, I got an email two minutes later. I thought, okay, sure, that's, that's the confirmation that I opened the ticket. But it says, no, my name is whatever his name is. I've looked at your ticket. Congratulations, you can now spin up 80 machines in two minutes, right? So that's one of the things that we need to... Um, look at how can we, it doesn't have to be OpenShift, it doesn't have to be Kubernetes, how can we use automation, how can we look at the processes to get developers faster access to the resources that they need. Interface design, documentation with the impl implications on security, right, it's, it's um, I'll tell you more about this in a second. Um, quick prototyping, right, how can I, how can I get started, how we, we, we go to all these meetups and learn about Kubernetes and Kafka and, and, and all these science fiction uh, pieces, right? which, which I also use and which we also have to use. But if I'm, if I'm new, if I'm starting, if I'm experimenting, if I'm prototyping, I need access to something real quick by today. And I don't have the bandwidth to set up a whole infrastructure uh, and, and wait for, for three months. I need something now. Um, and the last part is, which I picked, is um, mocking of data, right? Where you, if you work with APIs, you probably have, a come, have come across the weather API and the fantastic, well, I like Star Wars, but the Star Wars API is nice, right? And there is a, a few others, the, the pet store, right? The, the, the all-time favorite. They are awesome, but they, they don't get you into that mindset. And in many cases, that's not even the technology that you're using. So I'll look at the clock in a moment, but um, I know you see a lot of presentations. You hear a lot of stuff during the day. I want to make sure that when you walk out of this session, if, I'm happy if you only remember three things, and that's the three things I'm passionate about. Right? Start with the interface, which is the design. Divide and conquer, which means, right, in many cases, do you really have to code? And can you find something that does the job for you and does it across um, the setup for you consistently? And the third one is, well, actually, I've built, I've built a few tools that might be of interest for you when it comes to mocking data. So I just want you to remember these three things. Number one, right? Design first. Right? Um, when you've um, been in some of the previous sessions, you've, you've either 
heard a lot or even worked a lot with the open API specification. It used to be called Swagger, right? So it, something like this that you see on the left side. I personally don't enjoy working in that YAML or JSON format for the definition because I prefer to uh, use Stoplight or um, Postman to, to, to uh, get these things going. But ultimately, it's the contract. What's the data model? What does the API do? What can I get? What can I ask? What's the authentication? And maybe, maybe what's the license, right? As someone who is extremely hands-on, it's, it's so, so tempting to, to really get, get Atom fired up or maybe Visual Studio and just, just code away. And the problem is then the moment you have this in, in, in a testing, in a, in a semi-production environment, and then you have different versions and, and there is other things that come in, it's, it's starting to be a problem, right? So it's actually quite simple. And if you use some of these tools to really start with the interface, start with the design, start with the data model, you don't have to be a coder even to do this. Because once you have this, once you have that Swagger document, you can automate, you know how many, how many developers enjoy writing documentation? I actually do, but many don't, right? So if you have the Swagger document, you can generate documentation automatically. You can generate test suites automatically. You can even generate SDKs in, in Python and in Java, in, if you absolutely must, in, in JavaScript, right? Uh, automatically, right? So this should be the start, design first. Yeah, divide and conquer, right? So typically, I'm, I mean, what interests me is not so much what happens in the engine room. You've seen me with the F1 slide, hello world in five minutes, right? What, what our consumers want is this, right? They want to go to an API portal, a shopping uh, system where I say, oh, which are the Lego pieces that I can use, right? I use Twilio to send SMS, I use Google Maps, I use Facebook, I use YouTube, whatever they are. How do I interact with them? How can I get API keys, right? And actually, I'm mostly interested in the HTTP JSON workloads, and I want a sandbox. And it, it, it doesn't matter if, if the backend runs um, on, on a Raspberry Pi on, or on a mainframe. I'm expecting uh, these bits at the beginning. So the good part is that in the old world, you had to make that choice. Everybody in the company needs to be a Java person. Everybody needs to be a .NET person. Right? You can now just use the best tools for the job. Right? You have the, the, the website running in Ruby on Rails, the data piece in Python, the, the authentication integration in .NET. Right? You just wrap them up in containers, um, use APIs for the, them to, to connect with each other. It's all awesome. But I think I mean, we, we spoke about what developers enjoy doing and what they are not enjoying to do. And I, I think and I'm with uh, my... Um, colleague on this who spoke earlier, right? The security part, the API management part, uh, should be separate, right? And, and, and for the simplification, I just put this in the blue box, right? I just need someone who is in front of the API, something like a, a bodyguard, right? I gotta see your ticket, otherwise you can't use my API, right? And there is a free tickets and there is premium tickets, you get the drift. And there is a translation, a translation as well. My, my backend speaks only SOAP. You want JSON. Let me, let me translate that for you, right? So you need, you need that part in the middle. This, and this is typically what API management does, right? And yes, you can enhance it with artificial intelligence to, uh, well, find traffic that you didn't even think it was malicious, but the AI learns about it. And you, and you plug those in, right? So divide and conquer. Yes, I'm a, I'm a geek. Yes, I'm a coder. So the first part was don't, don't start with the coding. Start with the contract. The second part was, yes, you can code, but can you please find out which parts are already there and which parts are already helping you? Uh, because OAuth, the only way for me to understand OAuth is because I implemented a client and a server on the protocol level. Before that, you know what, I just had a rough idea what OAuth does, and as long as it worked, it was okay. Right? You don't want five different OAuth implementations in your backend. Let, let the API management do that part. Okay, well, this is the last, the last part. I've started, I've st anybody can read Japanese? 
Anybody? Yeah, a little? So that, that if my Google Translate is right, it says this is not a real bank. Right? <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a fictional bank. Um, so in essence, it's an open source project, and I invite you to not only use it, but also help me to make it better. By now, I have like thousands of Docker pulls, and sometimes I wish I knew where all these people are, right? So these are, and I mentioned that earlier, we have the Pet Store API, we have the Star Wars, we have the Weather API. I'm not saying these are production grade systems, but they help people get into the open banking. Um, because, yeah, I just, I just need to show people how easy it is to do stuff, and I want something that is more banking related. So you can use those Docker images. They are on average like 25 megabytes, so extremely small, built in Python, but that's really irrelevant in this case. All right, so you can, you can run them on, on Mac, on Windows, on Linux, on anywhere that you can run containers. All right, so you do a simple docker pull command. And since this, this workshop is a little more technical, I'll also show you a few examples. So apart from the docker containers, I recently also launched them as a live service. I'm already having a few thousand requests per day, so the moment this lifts off, I probably need to move that somewhere else. But, so you have an ATM locator, right? Along with the Swagger definitions, along with the link to the Swagger editor, and live endpoints with sample requests. You can do currency exchange, forens, right? And, and how many people are uh, using SOAP or ESBs, right? I, I realized uh, there was a lot, and I realized there was not a lot of mock services that actually emulate an ESB or a SOAP, a SOAP service. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, fixed deposit, investment products, stock quotes. So they, they are all dynamic and they are all self-contained. So they will not make any calls to any databases. They are all within that Docker container. So that means if you're inside a bank, for example, you can spin them up and everything runs in that small container. And as I show you here, you can also, if you have internet access, if you have a POC, a demo, a training that you have to do, you can use them to, to provide a little more open banking context uh, to what you are about to show. All right, so ATM locations, for example. I mentioned the document. So before I build those, I actually used Stoplight to define what the API looks like. So this one is that something I didn't have to code. I click, 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 enter a few things, it renders everything, right? So now if I, if I pull up my terminal, I can actually do a curl command either to the live endpoint, which is on the web, or to the Docker container that you spun up on your OpenShift, on your MacBook, on your whatever machine that has Docker running. Okay, thank you. And you see that there is a dynamic response, right? So if you have currency exchange, for example, it'll always give you a timestamp, it'll always give you a different response, so you have dynamic data. Last example is uh, the, the ESB, the SOAP engine that I mentioned, right? Which is something that I've not been able to find anywhere. Can I, uh, there was a delayed stock quote uh, web service that has a broken whistle, but it was okay-ish, right? But it's on the web. What if I want this self-contained in a, in a container on my private network, right? So this, this, this container or this live web service you can pull and it'll give you a, a whistle document and the moment you send requests to it, it'll always give you, a, well, the, uh, the amount of assets the bank has and the amount of debt the bank has and each request will have a slightly, a slightly different number because it's a, it's a very busy bank, they do a lot of stuff. It's, it's dynamic, right? I use this one to show SOAP to REST conversions, right? When, when we speak about API management and say, you know what, it's actually quite easy, and specifically with the tools that, that uh, our company offers, right? It's very easy to do, and I can show you that in five minutes. We spin up that ESB, that, that SOAP engine. We, we use a few drag and drop controls, almost like in Visio, and you have a JSON endpoint where the backend actually only speaks SOAP, right? And that's it for my session, right? So what, uh, I hope you keep the three points in mind. Design first, divide and conquer, use mock services. There is a, a few things that I put on my GitHub, right? Exercises, code, presentations. I'll, I'll, I'll be very honored if you follow or add me on LinkedIn. That will be nice. Use some of the uh, open banking APIs. And most of all, I mean, it's, it's so awesome that we are 
here together in the real world, right? As much as APIs help us to build cool gadgets and, and, and all these digital wonders, it's, it's fantastic to connect with you face to face, and I hope we get to do this in the lunch break. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you.